our speaker collaborators for this evening. Matthew Burgess is an assistant professor at Brooklyn College. He's published several books of poetry, nonfiction, and children's literature, including the much acclaimed Enormous Smallness, and most recently, Drawing on Walls. Um, Josh Cochran grew up in Taiwan and California. He works as an illustrator based in Brooklyn, specializing in bright, dense, and conceptual drawings. In 2013, his work on Ben Queller's Go Fly a Kite received a Grammy nomination for Best Limited Edition Packaging. He has a number of side projects and sometimes exhibits his work in galleries. Josh has um, a children's book published by Big Picture Press, Inside Out New York, and the, these two marvelous people collaborated on this book uh, about Keith Haring, which they will now tell us all about. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Ariel and, uh, and Sam and everyone at the Greenwich Village Society for Historical Preservation. Um, we really appreciate you hosting this event. Uh, we're very excited to share a brand new publication. It was just published on uh, May 19th. And the book, which is both behind me and here, is called Drawing on Walls, A Story of Keith Haring. Um, I am the author of the book, and Josh is the amazing illustrator, and it's published by Enchanted Lion Books. Um, I want to start by just saying that we're here to both share the book uh, with you. We're going to read an excerpt from it, and also to tie it into Greenwich Village and New York City more largely. Um, Keith was very influenced and inspired by New York City and, and really specifically um, the East Village where he lived when he moved to New York. And uh, he made various projects in the village as well, which we'll talk about some of those um, and share those with you so that some of you can maybe track them down and see them uh, for yourselves. Um, I'll start by just giving a some brief information about me. I moved to New York City in 1998, uh, moved to the East Village. I lived on East Fifth and B um, for the first few years that I lived in New York, which is just about four blocks away from one of Keith Haring's uh, early addresses on First Avenue. Um, I got my MFA at Brooklyn College in 2001, so I was commuting from the East Village to Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, and then I started teaching New York, I started teaching poetry in New York City public schools through an organization called Teachers and Writers Collaborative. Um, and so I really ended up kind of working with early elementary kids and teaching creative writing, um, which is one of the avenues that led me to writing for children. Um, my first book, for kids is called Enormous Smallness, A Story of E.E. E. Cummings, also published by Enchanted Lion. And I mention it in part because the village plays a really important role in that book as well. E.E. Um, e. Cummings, like Keith Haring, came to New York City in order to pursue his life as an artist. Um, Edward Eslin Cummings was both a poet and a painter, and he moved to one of his uh, addresses, or the address where he stayed for almost 40 years is in Patchen Place, which is on Sixth Avenue South and uh, West 10th Street, right next to Jefferson Market Library. Um, so that book is also really largely set in the village and you can see the kind of the influence, the inspiration that he took from that neighborhood in this specific place that we are celebrating and, and thinking about um, tonight. Um, so I then went on to get my PhD at the Graduate Center. So I've really been in New York City now for about 20 years and I now uh, teach in the English department at Brooklyn College. Um, so let me pass it over to Josh to, uh, to introduce himself. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Matthew. Uh, my name is Josh Cochran and I uh, am an illustrator artist uh, living here in Brooklyn, New York. I uh, live in Clint Hill, actually, and I've lived here uh, in New York for about uh, 11 years now. Um, and before that, I lived in K-12 
California where I got my uh, art degree at the Art Center of College of Design and also lived in Taiwan and uh, California and uh, Washington State as well. So um, been all over the place and uh, uh, enjoying this new level of uh, New York living now during the pandemic. <laughs> Um, I, I also, uh, I guess, I'd talk a little bit about my work. Uh, I, I work primarily as an illustrator, um, doing a lot of illustrations for uh, advertising companies as well as editorial. Um, I also uh, do murals, um, which uh, I think helped me uh, understand this project a little bit more from a, a sort of muralist uh, perspective. Um, and yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Been drawing since I was a small, small child. <laughs> and Josh also has a mural located in uh, Greenwich Village. Oh yes, yes. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's actually it's uh, the Shake Shack on Varick Street, Varick and Clarkson. Um, and if you go to the the bathrooms, which is on the, uh, it's kind of like the second. Uh, the basement area where the um, innovation kitchen is, whatever you can see, like there's like a, a mural in the bathroom that I've worked on. So uh, go check it out. Josh and I also have the California connection because um, I grew up in California um, and Josh went to college in LA. Um, and I should also mention I'm in Berlin right now, so it's midnight. So if I seem a little sleepy, that's the reason. Um, <laughs> My husband lives in Berlin, and I was able to uh, escape from New York narrowly uh, last week. So um, I want to start by just sharing some of the book, a brief excerpt. I know that this isn't a read aloud. It's not a story hour. But um, I also I think this book can really be appreciated for grown-ups or kids of all ages. Um, and plus, we want to share with you some of the illustrations or just some of the language. Um, so we're going to start with Keith's arrival in New York City in 1978. Um, so let me, I'm going to attempt here a screen share. And uh, hopefully you can all see this. Um, if you can't, tell Ariel uh, in the chat. All right, so here we're gonna, this is of course an excerpt. So if you're reading the book, you've already seen Keith grow up as a child and now he has decided to make the big move to New York City. He went shortly to study commercial art for a time and he realized that it wasn't for him. And so I'm gonna jump into the text and let you get a peek of a few pages here. Inspired, Keith now knew what he had to do to find the intensity and freedom that he desired. Hold on a second. Keith arrived in New York City and enrolled at the School of Visual Arts. He was 20 years old. One day he found rolls of paper that someone had tossed into the gutter. He enrolled them in the studio at school and began making bigger and bigger paintings. Keith especially liked painting on the floor by the open door where the sunlight poured in. People passing on the street would stop to watch or talk to him about what he was making. Keith loved it. He didn't believe that some people understand art while others don't, or that art should be hidden away in galleries, museums, and private collections. Keith wanted to communicate with as many people as possible. The public has a right to art. Art is for everybody. The East Village was Keith's new neighborhood. With his friends, he formed Club 57, a local hangout in the basement of a church on St. Mark's Place. A few years later, when Keith was 23, he fell in love with a DJ named Juan DeVos. Keith listened to Juan's music while he drew, and Juan cooked big meals in their tiny kitchen. Together, they were happy. Keith wasn't earning money from his paintings yet, so he worked as a bicycle messenger, a sandwich maker on 7th Avenue, a bartender at the Mud Club, 
an art assistant in a Soho gallery. He even got a job picking wildflowers in New Jersey. But his favorite job ever was drawing with children at a daycare center in Brooklyn. There is nothing that makes me happier than making a child smile. With his artist friend, Fab Five Freddy, Keith walked through Alphabet City, admiring all the graffiti. He loved the colors, the size, the fluid lines, and the blossoming of art on the streets where people could see and enjoy it. One night, while strolling down King Street in the West Village, Keith heard the thump and beat of music and discovered Paradise Garage. He was mesmerized by the dancers spinning on their heads and doing the electric boogie as disco and hip hop rocked the room. For Keith, drawing and painting were like dancing. He called it mind to hand flow. One day in the subway, Keith noticed blank panels where advertisements used to be. Suddenly, he zipped up to the street, bought a box of white chalk, dashed back downstairs, and began drawing on the walls. People paused as they rushed from here to there. For Keith, this is what art was all about, the moment when people see it and respond. Maybe it makes them smile, maybe it makes them think, Maybe it inspires them to draw or dance or write or sing. So those are just a few pages of Josh's wonderful illustrations and um, just a snippet of how important New York City was to Keith's work. He really came here specifically because he was craving the intensity um that new york city provided him and he wanted to be in the center of everything um and i'm gonna read to you a passage from the journals uh i really recommend this book for anyone who's interested in keith herring he one of the reasons that i was so excited to write this book and share this book is that once you start to read his writing and the more you learn about him um he starts to develop so much dimension as a person. He was so articulate and so intelligent and so thoughtful about his art practice and art in general. Um, and so this passage that I want to share kind of gives, I think, everyone a glimpse of what he was thinking about at 20 years old when he arrived in New York City. Um, so really, this is dated October 14th, 1978. Um, and I'm just going to read the first few sentences and then, um, and then share another detail. So it starts off, as I sit here and write, I feel comfortable. It is somewhat unusual to feel comfortable in Washington Square Park. There are so many different ways to experience the phenomena of the city. A given situation can have an unlimited number of different effects on a person's thoughts, depending on the state of mind and attitude. Something that affects me today will not necessarily affect me tomorrow. Nothing is constant. And you, um, he's really just winding up for a journal entry that goes on for pages and pages. And it, it's one of the first moments in the journals where he really um, struggles and I think succeeds in articulating his role as an artist and how he sees himself and um, what he wants to achieve. So he's 20 years old when he's writing this. And it's too long to read the entire passage. It's, um, it's kind of astonishing that he wrote it. But I, I wanted to share that because he's writing it in, in Washington Square Park. So right in the heart of Greenwich Village, here he is sitting outside um, and writing in his journal. And I wanted to just add a little bit of context to that space and the significance of Washington Square Park. Um, when I was researching the E. Cummings book, one of the things I found is that there was this night, it was January 23rd, 1917, and this group of pranksters, which included Marcel Duchamp, and also this young artist, Gertrude, um, Gertrude Drick, they, they snuck into the Washington Square Arch and climbed up to the top and went through a trap door, and they brought wine and sandwiches and balloons, and there was uh, lightly falling snow and they had 
uh, declaration that Greenwich Village was um, an independent republic, uh, a free and independent republic. Um, and so I, the reason I pivot to that story is that here we are, you know, um, quite, quite a few years earlier, but in this same, occupying the same space. And it really shows how Washington Square and the village for so many years was a place where people went in order to find artistic kinship, in order to find like-minded people, in order to try to launch their careers as artists. Um, and so it gives you a little context of the city of that space, I think. Um, and there's so many stories like that, uh, so many wonderful stories about those years uh, in the village when really it was this bohemian sanctuary, a place where you fled to. Um, okay, so to continue with this excerpt from Keith's journals, uh, it's really the emphasis I wanna put place here is on his thinking about art as um, its public significance. The public has a right to art. The public is being ignored by most contemporary artists. The public needs art, and it is the responsibility of a self-proclaimed artist to realize the public needs art, and not to make bourgeois art for the few and ignore the masses. Art is for everybody. And I'm skipping. The decision is basically, is art for an educated few or is art for all people of all time? Is art for self? Is art simply fulfilling an artist's ego relationship? I am interested in making art to be experienced and explored by as many individuals as possible with as many different ideas about the given piece with no final meaning attached. The viewer creates the rea reality, the meaning, the conception of the piece. I am merely a middleman trying to bring ideas together. So the journals are so good. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, so I wanted to ask you, Josh, um, how those ideas of Keith's about the public nature of art resonate with you, your art practice. Um, I also, you know, I gave you the journals when we were starting the project. So what did, what did you, what's your response to that side of Keith's? Um, you know, I, I think that I really uh, identified with uh, this idea of, you know, Keith coming to the city, to the big city, you know, from uh, a relatively small town and uh, really kind of having his mind blown away and being so influenced by a variety of different types of people and different ideas and all the textures of the city. Um, I think that's something that I, I uh, totally felt when I moved here to New York, you know, just uh, every moment was like, epic New York moment, you know, like going over the bridge or like biking through the village or whatever. It's just, uh, uh, I could, I could immediately respond to that. And, uh, and I think that his, uh, I think his uh, philosophy as far as, um, why he makes art and what, um, art is was something that I definitely felt as well, but then I wasn't able to, um, perhaps put into uh, words as eloquent as he could. But he talks quite a bit about this idea of uh, mind-to-hand flow, which you mentioned. Um, and also in the journals, he, uh, he discusses quite a bit about like this idea of um, what, you know, what he's really looking for is this unselfconscious line or this moment uh, yeah. when he's making art where he's not like aware of making this thing that's like for someone or for something. And it's just like, you know, when he gets deep into the drawing, then all of a sudden he enters this uh, flow state or whatever, and then he's able mm -hmm. to uh, make something that's surprising uh, to him and also to, uh, it comes across also to people that uh, who, uh, look at it as well, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that, uh, I don't know, I'm sure you remember this as well, but I was, you know, like we were working on this project for, I don't know, four, four years for me and, uh, even longer, I guess, for you uh, when you first started it. And I was like struggling halfway through and and uh, and we had like a text ex exchange about it where you were like, uh, you know, people really, or uh, you, you were trying to tell me that I, uh, about my um, mindset, you know, when I was sitting down to draw, you know, like really having this like, oh, right. 
kind of having like an open, you know, um, just enjoying the feeling of drawing or the, the, the feeling of painting. And I think that's something that uh, we definitely focused on here with his, uh, with what he was talking about in his journals, you know? And, and I think like when I started to approach the, uh, this massive project with that in mind, then all of a sudden it, it sort of uh, flipped a switch in a way, you know, like I was able to like, uh, uh, really focus more on the enjoyment of the the paint on the paintbrush, you know, like uh, focusing intently on a uh, on the piece of paper or the layout or whatever, you know. Um, it's really a uh, fascinating kind of way to make art, and I think it's definitely changed my uh, art practice uh, going forward. Yeah, that idea came from Keith's reading of Robert Henri's The Art Spirit. Mm -hmm. And in that book, uh, which is an incredible book, Keith actually found it at a sort of um, stoop sale uh, in Cutstown. Uh, this is the page that documents that moment where he finds the book. And one of the excerpts here is, do whatever you do intensely, the artist leaves the crowd and goes pioneering. Um, but another excerpt that didn't actually make it into the book, but was in an original manuscript was, about the line and about Robert Henri articulates this idea that um, the feeling of the artist in the moment of applying the stroke or the line. So the feeling that the artist has in that moment of, of actually making the mark is transmitted to the viewer of the work. Mm -hmm. So that there's actually this like energy transferred or transmitted to the viewer. Um, and that relates to what we were talking about where the idea is that if you're enjoying or having fun or feeling um, full of life as you make the thing, that that is somehow transmitted or comes across. Yeah, and and I think that it's a kind of a radical idea in a way, you know, compared to how a lot of people learn how to draw or how, how a lot of people approach art making, you know, where a lot of times it's about the, the lay-in or the sketch or the, um, you know, like sort of like you practice a few times and then you knock it in, you know, and I think that uh, uh, Keith Haring uh, definitely went at it with a completely different approach and uh, the work, you know, you can definitely see it in the work. You can see it with the drips, you can see it with uh, sort of the um, effortless feeling of the composition. Um, it's really kind of uh, incredible. Actually, I found a, um, I don't know if it's too soon to show this, but I, I found an old, uh, an old uh, video of, uh, just to set it up a little bit, it's uh, a mural that Keith painted at my, uh, the art school that I went to, uh, Art Center in California. And uh, someone, uh, actually someone named uh, Hadi Salehi, sorry, apologies if I butcher the name. Um, this person uh, shot uh, Keith making the mural um, with a Super 8. And I think this was back in uh, 1989. And uh, uh, this mural is still up at Art Center right now. And I, uh, when I first started going to school there, I had no idea really um, who Keith was. You know, I, I, I mentioned I grew up uh, overseas in Taiwan and a lot of sort of pop American pop culture or Western pop culture things. Um, I didn't really know too much about, but by the time I uh, learned about Keith and learned a little bit more about the mural, um, it was already kind of worked its way into my uh, mind. And um, I feel like it has definitely been a huge influence on my uh, professional work, you know, to this day. It's just uh, like uh, something about the, the way he approaches the, the painting, um, the colors, you know, the kind of uh, spontaneous feeling of it is something that I have, uh, you know, it's like wormed its way into my mind a little bit. Um, so I, maybe uh, I will try to uh, share this screen. But you have to stop sharing, Matthew. Oh. He is, don't worry, it's all good. Oh, he is? Okay. I did it, yeah. Okay. And there's no uh, sound on this, but you guys can kind of see uh, sort of uh, his approach. This is the, and this is the mural that um, is still there right now. Um, clearly, 
he just appro- like just kind of went for it, uh, which I really love. Um, kind of uh, really confident line uh, line work, no sketching or anything. Um, just kind of going with uh, what felt right to him. And uh, um, it's interesting to see you know, like some areas where he's painting quite fast, you know, and some of the uh, more intricate areas, he's slowing down a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, quite incredible. Um, yeah, I, I, I was curious, I wanted to ask you about that because we, during the process of making the book, we spoke about how that mural influenced you or that you, you were talking about, like, you would stop and look at it every day. Mm -hmm. And then, um it was what was happening do you think in those like repeated encounters with the mural like what were you thinking? Uh, what was i think i i actually have a let me see if i can pull it up <clears throat> i think i um i kept on finding things uh about it that i you know i would discover things about this uh like right. any great piece of art you know um uh and you know like my first read of it was definitely something like i was like what is this i didn't really understand this at all um uh but then the longer i sat with it the more i was able to kind of um, glean meaning from it you know for myself or uh um and 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 i think because i was in art school i was also very curious about how he actually made it you know like there wasn't really any explanation or anything just had his uh, signature uh, in the corner. Um, I was really like curious about the drips, of course, and like, did he pre-mix the paint ahead of time? Did he have like a giant palette or something? And now, you know, obviously we we know that he just sort of uh, painted from buckets of paint. <laughs> someone, <laughs> um, cool. someone in the one of the attendees asked where it is. Oh, it's uh, it's in Pasadena, California, um, Art Center College of Design on the Hillside campus. I believe uh, anyone can go see it. You know, um, probably can just walk right in. I think. I think um, that's something that's so striking that a lot of people don't know about Keith Haring is that when he would initiate these giant murals, uh, almost in almost every instance, he didn't rely on any prior sketches right so he would of course have the paint and he probably had ideas about what he wanted to do but he was really committed to this idea of being in the kind of like sacred moment of making something and being that spontaneous and really improvising so like letting the work of art unfold um which i think is felt when you look at it in part because it's this dance and like you were struck by the dripping paint, that it wasn't perfect, that the imperfection or the, the velocity of the, of the body making that could be felt um, later. And that that's something that's hard to achieve. I mean, you're a muralist and you probably can't get away with just attacking a wall without submitting yeah. sketches ahead of time and getting approval, right? Like, right, yeah, yeah. I I, I think for um, uh, like working for a, a corporate client or for uh, doing something for money, you know, uh, generally there's like a, a process uh, involved, you know, um, people that hire me want to see what it's going to look like. Um, and so the sort of the nature of working in, um, in uh, commercial illustration or, or commercial art, um, you have to kind of show the client what they're, going to be buying or what they're paying for essentially so uh i i actually was really I, i've been most of my career i feel like i've been very frustrated with how to maintain a little bit of that freshness or still like be able to to uh have like that spontaneous line or that uh spontaneous like unselfconscious moment in the work even if it is for uh some you know some corporate job or something you know mm -hmm. like still trying to find my art within it um i think that's been something that i have always struggled with uh it's i've tried a variety of different things you know a lot of times when i um uh start a piece i'll just start in the corner and um draw out mm -hmm. um 
I uh, I have some sketches that I could show you guys um, that might uh, help. Let's see. Okay. Um, While you're looking, I want to ask you one other question, which you don't have to answer now. But um, uh -huh. in addition to the like response of the viewer, um, feeling the kind of the transmission of of the feeling of the artist in the act of creation. Um, Keith also really loved the public nature of painting murals. So that he actually loved, you know, people watching and participating and asking questions and walking by. And so for him, it was um, also about the act of making being public. And he would turn the creation of murals into interactive experiences often working with kids and inviting kids to participate in various ways. Um, our book opens with a mural that he made in Japan where he, had, he did the outlines and the kids helped to like fill in certain sections of the mural. But also, how is it for you? Yeah, there, that's, that page illustrates that really well. But I wanted to ask, how is it for you to be painting in public and to have people walking by and interacting with you? Is that something also that you enjoy or is that intimidating or what's your experience of that i i love it i think it's uh it's in a way kind of the highest form you know of art because it's so immediate you know and uh it's something that people interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and uh you know, like how i described my experience seeing uh keith's mural um it's something that perhaps someone can like live with for many years, you yeah. know, and like see how it changes and how their relationship with the uh, mural changes as well. Um, and and while I'm painting it, it's actually quite interesting to uh, see people react to it. You know, they're trying to figure out what it's going to be or they're like, oh, why are you using this color here? Or uh, uh, sometimes people get like a little critical and they want me to. Um, All right. Right. change something or you know they, they'll have suggestions or something <laughs> or, but I feel like for the most part everyone's uh, uh, quite respectful and it, it's just like nice to uh, talk to people that are actually responding to your work as you're making it you know it's a very rare thing and it doesn't for me it doesn't necessarily feel like I'm like at a you know like on display or something like at a petting zoo or something it feels a little bit more pure for some reason <laughs> Well, you notice when people are writing or drawing or making something on the subway or in public, like everyone mm. watches. I mean, there's something about that creative moment that draws people's attention. Yeah. Um, there's some magic there. Yeah. So and, tell, uh, sorry. Talk sorry. to us about what you're showing. Tell us about what oh, you're okay. showing. So um, I just wanted to show a little bit about this kind of this process of, of making the book. Um, and uh, a lot of times I keep, try to keep the freshness um, mm. at the beginning, the sketch stage. Um, and obviously for this book, uh, we had to kind of see how the whole thing would lay out. Um, I wanted to uh, show you guys sort of, you know, a place where we could talk about like uh, how the story was developing. And, and, and I feel like uh, also for you to see this at this stage, then um, I, there was like some edits too with the with the manuscript that uh, like you you could see like this right. was like working here or whatever this needed to be cut down and so I, I think that was sort of an interesting process that uh, um, that we went through. Uh, the other thing I'm seeing here that might be interesting for people to hear is how you move how and why you move from digital drawing to painting. Yeah, so I um, I did, I started here with a sketch, you know, um, and then I did like a sort of a tighter drawn, but still digital with flat color. Um, and uh, I used this method uh, very similarly to how I create a mural. Um, I have everything kind of essentially figured out, you know, like what colors I'm going to use. And then, I'll, and then uh, when I made this, I could still see that it didn't quite feel um, rough enough or like you know kind of dirty enough or like raw enough for uh, for this book you know because we uh, I, I think the nature of Keith's work and also like 
some of the things that we talked about uh, as far as uh, keeping it spontaneous, it still didn't quite have that feeling for me. So uh, I sort of like took this and then started over and like, you know, just use that as a, a guide or a template to paint from, you know, so I, so I kind of used that. Um, I had like a computer set up and then I was like mixing colors on the side and sort of like keeping it sort of as a reference, but then I'm still like developing um, uh, this own kind of painting language here right. that uh, I think in the end, it feels like it fit better. You know, um, one of the things that I wanted to do with the book was to keep it as loose or as like kind of crumbly or, you know, gnarly. And like, I, I, in the very beginning, I was like really um, fixated on like trying to mix the colors exactly or like make it really, you know, like almost like have pre-mixed colors, like Pantone colors or whatever. But then very quickly threw it all away, you know, just try to like have fun with it. And for me, the the process of making this was uh, the most enjoyable. You know, I think if I was more like, um, I don't know, like an assembly line or something, then it wouldn't have been quite as uh, fun for me. But the um, difference between doing the digital drawings and painting, and I think readers won't know when they encounter our book, is that you could have completed it in a much shorter amount of time if you had left it at the digital drawings, but you decided yeah. to paint it. So that you basically started over and decided to paint the entire book, which took years. Yeah, I, I like made two, I, I essentially made it twice. <laughs> right. And uh, did that decision, was, was partially that decision about making a book about one of your artistic heroes and feeling like you wanted to stretch or reach in a certain way? Yeah, um, actually that's a, something I, I, I've never really talked to you about, but I, I felt like there was so much pressure, you know, like uh, Keith Haring is such a huge, huge figure. Um, everyone knows who he is. And of course my peers would be like looking at this book or, or, or whoever, um, you know, like I'm, I'm putting my name on it and like people that like love Keith Haring or whatever. Um, I felt like there was a really high bar that I had to uh, pass. And I think for me, it was, it was quite crippling in a way to think about uh, this project like that. And um, ultimately I had to like really just uh, uh, push it out of my mind, you know. Um, I think that's kind of why it, it took so long. Um, and uh, strangely enough, I think when I embraced this like method that was so imperfect, imperfect and this method where I didn't have a lot of control over I was able to kind of let go and I think the project uh, became better at that point you know rather than something that was like really tightly controlled and like completely figured out or whatever uh, on a digital level you know yeah, yeah. yeah. so I know that um, I, I noticed I read some something in the chat about people thinking that this was gonna be more about Greenwich Village. So I thought that maybe we'd turn to some of the sites that um, are both in the book and also specific sites that people who are interested in Keith Haring and in seeing some of his work um, could visit or just learn a little bit about. Um, so I'm going to share some images of some sites here uh, that might be interesting, some of which you can see and some of which um, you cannot see. Let me see if I can get this here. Let's see. Um, sorry about that. I have to... The screen sharing, it's tricky. The screen sharing is tricky. It's showing, it's, it's coming up with the book here and I wanna... Um, Maybe sure. I click on the wrong screen. Let me see here. Just affirming that it is so tricky. <laughs> well, our, our, uh, our tortured Zoom life. Hmm. Is, um, it, is it minimized by any chance? Let's see. Oh, it's us. It's us again? 
Okay, I'm gonna try one more time. All right. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay, great. So this is an image of Paradise Garage. Um, and as I mentioned in the book, uh, this was located on 84 King Street uh, between Hudson and Barrick. So it just steps away from where Josh's mural is now. Um, the Paradise Garage was discovered one night uh, when Keith was walking with Fab Five Freddy and he heard the music and walked in and basically found what to him was like church. Like the, it, it became his favorite part of the week. It was, um, he went on Saturday nights. Sometimes he would plan his travels around Paradise Garage. Um, and it shows up in his artwork. So if you, you can probably, those of you who know Keith Haring, you can probably imagine the, um, the dancers and the sort of radiating lines coming off of break dancers and uh, people doing um, the electric boogaloo. And um, so this, this incredible iconic nightclub uh, was a huge source of inspiration for him. Um, and that's also why I wanted to include it in the book. And one of my favorite images is Josh's spread, um, which we sort of joke to ourselves, though we don't know if this is true, that it might be um, the first time that uh, essentially a gay disco appears in children's literature. Um, although it was also, uh, there was a mixed night, there was a gay night, and it became um, just something that people didn't want to miss. And Madonna performed there, and Diana Ross performed there, and the famous DJ uh, was Larry Levan. Um, so here's a couple images. Here's Keith uh, at Paradise Garage um, with someone wearing one of his, uh, his Are we here? Oh, did Matthew freeze? He must have. Matthew's in uh, um, Berlin right now. Oh, there, there you're, you're oh. good now, Ma oh. Matthew. Something Am I back? Yeah, you're, you're back. back. You're back. Okay, great. Well, All right. Um, so let me just give you a few more glimpses here. Here's Keith uh, with a crowd of friends at Paradise Garage. Then in 1982, uh, he did his first major outdoor mural on Houston and Bowery. Um, it no longer exists, but maybe some of you out there remember this mural. It was also reconstructed years later uh, for a time period. But um, so here's Keith in the act of painting that mural. Um, and here is a smaller image of sort of the whole mural. And if you look closely, you can see Keith right in the middle. Um, another iconic spot is the Carmine Street pool, um, which is still, which still exists. So everyone can see this mural. Um, it was executed in 1987 uh, and it was restored about 10 years later. So this is, this is something you could include on your Keith Haring village walk. Um, Here's another image of the Carmine Street Pool mural. Um, and then another famous spot that appears in our picture book biography is um, Club 57, which was located on 57 St. Mark's Place. And it was in the basement of a church, um, which is kind of hard to believe that that could happen now. It was in the basement of the Holy Cross Polish National Church. And um, here are, here's a group of friends who would perform there regularly. One of the nights they had was reggae putt-putt, reggae miniature golf. Um, also Keith, there are some really great videos of Keith performing on the little stage in the basement of Club 57 with um, essentially a television set over his head. And he would give these sort of Dadaist uh, poems um, with the TV over his head. So here's another cast of characters. And then this, if you, if you are to go on a kind of Keith Haring art walk in the village, um, this is a self-portrait. Uh, this is from 1989. Uh, and 
It's now at Astor Place and Third Avenue. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Um, here's another view of the self-portrait. So it's dated 1989, but it was installed at Astor Place just a few years ago. Um, and then this is an image of the pop shop, which was on Lafayette Street, just south of Houston. Um, and here's Keith sort of surrounded by uh, sort of full scale floor to ceiling mural um, that he created in the pop shop, which was open until 2005, I believe. Um, but also that no longer exists. Another mural that is a highlight um, is at the LGBT Center on 13th Street in the West Village. Um, it's called Once Upon a Time and uh, it's in the second floor bathroom. In 1989, a curator invited 50 artists to uh, design original works of art in the center um, to commemorate Stonewall. And Keith made a mural which still exists and it's incredible. It's racy, so I can't show pictures of it, uh, but it's, it's it's just incredibly stunning. Um, and you can walk into the center and walk up to the second floor and visit it and sort of just spend some time in that space and see um, this, this mural, which he, he rarely titled his murals, but he titled this one Once Upon a Time because it was a sort of celebration of sexuality before um, the AIDS crisis struck. Um, so it's this kind of wonderful uh, and orgiastic uh, mural. Probably one of his uh, best ones, maybe, or definitely one of my favorites. It's an incredible place in New York City. It's, it's just its own um, little world up there. And uh, a lot of people don't know about it. So it's, it's, it's really worth visiting. Um, and then, Here's a picture of me and Josh making a mural at uh, David A. Booty School in Gravesend, Brooklyn on Avenue S. Um, we uh, collaborated with our friend Natalie Nuzo, who's a teacher there, and um, worked on a mural in response to student poems. Um, so this is, this is like a public work art project that we created together and basically I taught poetry to the students there, middle school students. And um, we wrote a poem, we created a large collaborative poem and then had Josh come visit. And the students read the poem and shared it with Josh. And then in response, um, Josh designed and uh, installed this mural in, what was it two days? No, like uh, four, I think. Oh, four days. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk about oh, maybe, this? Maybe it was two days. I can't, I can't remember now. Maybe, I think uh, it was a weekend. What is, uh, I think after you, because you did a, you did a uh, workshop with, uh, with these kids and um, uh, when they were done, like a, a sh sort of the, all the poems were put together. And so I had this like several sheets of uh, poetry that the, uh, that the kids wrote and um, there wasn't really, uh, we were just like, let's just go for it <laughs> and uh, try to work in as much uh, of the po poetry as we could. Um, it was similar uh, to what we were talking about. Like some of the kids I think came up to me and were, and were like, you know, definitely want you to work in this thing. Or right. you know, like there was like a girl that wanted me to paint a unicorn in the corner and like yeah. uh, little little detail-y stuff. And so that was really fun to kind of like morph it a little bit as I uh, um, went about it. And, and um, also uh, we try to keep it as loose as we could, you know. Um, I didn't really sort of like true to uh, Keith Haring's way of working, didn't really plan it out or anything, just started uh, kind of like in one spot and like, grew out a little bit and and you know like if it if it needed something over here i would like draw something over here or paint something over here if it needs something over here i would uh change the colors or uh paint another thing over there um so it was really a uh, super fun super super fun project and we um it's part of this sort of 
project that I'm trying to develop called Poetry Urban Mural Project, where we invite muralists um, to respond to young people's writing. And so another component of this particular mural project that Josh and I did with our friend Natalie is um, we had an unveiling and then we had students write in response to the mural. So they were, were sort of led through like a, an exercise in observing the mural and then writing poems in response to it. Yeah, so fun. So I think um, we have about 10 minutes or maybe a little bit more. So I think maybe we should open it up if anyone has any questions. Ariel, are you um, fielding those? Hi, yeah, sure, I'm glad to. Um, we've got a question from Carol Teller. Hi, Carol, who wants to know if you can tell us a little bit about Keith's, Keith's childhood. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Keith, one of my favorite details, there's too much information to, I could just go on and on and on, but um, one, one detail that I love is that he drew with his father. His father was an amateur cartoonist and they drew together, which is also featured in, in the book. There's scenes of Keith um, drawing with his dad at the kitchen table and they would play games like, um, they would draw and then someone would yell stop and they would swap sheets and continue drawing. Uh, he also was kind of, would organize like contests and little clubhouses in the neighborhood, which kind of foreshadows what he did when he came to the East Village and he was, had this, um, side of him that he was an organizer and he liked to like bring people together and arrange art shows and um and i think one thing that i haven't said that's really tied to his childhood and how playful he was um that he really remained childlike through his whole life and more than maybe any other artist that i can think of he involved children in his artistic process um some people think that because there's so much like Keith Haring t-shirts and products and the pop shop, he gets this criticism that he was um, sort of like out to make a buck, which is just absolutely not true once you read about his reasoning for um, doing this kind of thing. But wherever he went in the world, he would do art projects for free with children. Um, so for him, he really like understood children and that comes from his childhood experience. Um, one other thing is there's this incredible school assignment that's on that paper that we learned how to write cursive for those of you that are my age or above. Um, and he wrote this composition where he basically said, this was when he's 10 years old and he basically said, when I'm, when I grow up, I want to be an artist in France and I want, I want to make money off the paintings that I make. Um, and so he kind of <laughs> manifested <laughs> this. He, in fact, one of his great, public artworks is a hospital, children's hospital in Paris um, that he did, I think in 98 or 99, um, where he, and he would, he would do these um, because he wanted to share his, his work and because he believed in it. So. Oh, so wonderful. Okay, a few more questions. Um, Only for Josh. <laughs> Um, well, I, ga I gave you a heads up on this question because it came in over email anyway. So what has been the hardest or, and or the most illuminating thing about collaborating together on this project? Mm. The hardest and most illuminating. Uh, huh. I think... You know, I well maybe like what what I said earlier. I think the just having the the pressure of you know working on a uh, like a biography of someone this famous, I think is uh, was somewhat crippling in the beginning. Um, so that was probably the hardest thing for me to uh, to overcome. And um, the most illuminating, I think I I think after or even partway through this project, I, I felt like we were like, we had like a big overlap, Matthew and I, you know, where kind of like uh, our approach to just the topic of this and like uh, our relationship to the city. And uh, yeah, it was really, it was kind of amazing to, to realize that like halfway through, you know, what we're working on it, it's cool. 
rare, a rare thing, perhaps. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the challenges is to find someone who really connects with Keith and, and understands his work and loves his work and is able to render that world in a way that feels not imitative, but complimentary. And I think, I mean, that's one of the things I was amazed at is to watch Josh develop the, the language and to build New York City. I mean, another challenge for this book is um, to find someone who really can create New York City in an illustrated world for kids. Um, so that was a big challenge, which I uh, was felt daunting at one point. And then when Josh came on board, it was pretty exciting. Well, I certainly think you succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks. So Amy and Stella, who is five years old in Hoboken, New Jersey, want to know what is your favorite picture by Keith? Mm -hmm. Oh, you got a hmm. It's hard to pick. So, there's so many. There's so many. Favorite. I do, I, you know, um, um, do I have the sticker here? Matthew gave me the, do I have it? Oh, yeah. I do love his, um, this, uh, you know, he does this. This is a sticker mm -hmm. that uh, Matthew gave me, this uh, kind of face of his. I love this character that he makes. It's uh, definitely one of my um, favorite drawings of his do you have a favorite i well i i um whenever anyone asks me favorite anything some part inner part of me refuses to answer because i can't single it down but um but but stella's five and i love the question so i the thing that came to mind stella is reminds me of that composition that keith wrote saying when i grew up i want to be an artist in france and there's this picture which you can find on the internet uh, if you if you Google Keith Haring blimp um, or hot air balloon and um, that there's actually a Keith Haring drawing which was um, blown up and put on the face of a hot air balloon and there's a picture of him where he's laying in a field of flowers and over his head in the background is this giant blimp um, I that. and let me see if I can pull it out yeah that that image is just so exciting because he was so single-minded and so determined to become an artist and and he he did it and that picture really kind of captures to me the fulfillment of of the little boy's dream yeah let me see if i can pull it up here. are you doing some wizardry josh i'm trying to i'm trying to thank you for that question so a, bu a bunch of folks have been asking, oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> I have that as a magnet on my fridge. <laughs> so perfect. Oh, that's so great. A, a bunch of people have, um, have asked if you know Keith or how you know Keith. Um, okay. And um, I guess, <coughs> pardon me. I guess, I guess that sort of leads me to this question which Kelly asked, which maybe can include that, is what about Keith specifically led you to, to want to create this book? Mm. So when I was a teenager, I must have been like 13, uh, there was a CD, um, <laughs> compact disc. Anyways, there's a CD that was, a, it was a Christmas compilation called A Very Special Christmas. And uh, the cover was by Keith Haring. And I was too young. I'd never been to New York City. I grew up in Southern California. But I just would stare at this cover and I was so struck by it. And I didn't, I don't know why, I didn't know why, but I was just, there was something about this image and this style that called to me. It was like voice in the wilderness kind of thing. And I, and I looked at the corner and I saw, you know, Kay Haring in the corner and, um, and I was intrigued. And then I started to, we didn't have the internet then. So this is like 87, so the internet didn't exist. So it was harder to, you couldn't just tap, tap, tap and, and find images. You had to kind of like find them some other way. And Keith's um, work was starting to circulate, but uh, it was exciting to find it. And I just felt a kinship, I can't explain it. I felt, I felt like, um, drawn to it. And then in 2012, there was an incredible retrospective at the Brooklyn Museum, which uh, is just like walking distance from my house. And 
that was one of the first times that I saw so much of Keith Haring's work in person. And I just was walking around those spacious gallery halls and, and I was just completely blown away. Like it sort of what Josh and I were talking about, about the transmission of energy that you can receive from his work. When you see it in person and you see these sort of large scale Keith Haring works, um, it was quickening. Like it made my heart race. And uh, you're, like, you're like, yeah, he's, he was, he was I was, I was, <laughs> it was like, and I just felt, you know, when you go to a museum, people out there and you see a work of art that, that really moves you and you just want to make like you, it, it triggers that response to want to go make something. Yes, absolutely. That's what happened. And then I walked in, this is, this sounds crazy, but um, I walked into the bookshop and it was, this book was sitting, you know, on a table and I opened it. Um, and it was like, it was one of those moments where I literally opened the book. This is my crazy um, copy. And I, I read, children know something that most people have forgotten. Children possess a fascination with their everyday existence that is very special and would be helpful to adults if they could learn to understand and respect it. And I read that and I was, and I had been teaching poetry in New York City public schools for 10 years at that point. And I just thought, wait, this is a kindred spirit. Like he gets it. And, um, and, and then I, if you go back and you read the whole passage, he's like, saying the most beautiful things about childhood and children. And he just understood kids. And that's when I thought, I want to make a book that introduces his life and work to kids. Um, and that sh and I think he would love it. Like, I think it just felt aligned with uh, who he was and his wishes. And then you found Josh. How did you find each other? Our, uh, our publisher actually put us uh, in contact with each other. Um, uh, at Enchanted Lion, <clears throat> uh, Cla Claudia, she, uh, she introduced us. Um, I think you guys were shopping around a little bit, right? Like, uh, trying to fit, find a, a right fit for this. Or uh, she was, or something. I actually, I had been, I was in Berlin when I wrote the first draft of the manuscript. And uh, there's this incredible, international children's bookstore that's like 10 minutes away. And um, I walked in that same summer that I was writing the manuscript and there was a little exhibition of Josh Cochran sketches and drawings and uh, images from your other book, Inside Out New York. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was, and then there was this one drawing of this guy uh, in pink marker uh, pushing a bicycle. And I was like, that looks like Keith Haring. And I bought Josh's book and I set it up as an accordion book and I set it up right here on my desk uh, the whole summer that I was writing the manuscript. But it didn't occur to me, I didn't put it together until um, about a year later when we were looking for the right illustrator. And, um, and then Claudia and Enchanted Lion brought up Josh and I looked at his work and I was like, wait a second, I know this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh... It was just one of those uh, things that kind of came together and um, everything kind of clicked into place perfectly. Um, also, in Chan and Lion, um, just working with an independent publisher like them has been uh, incredible. Like, we had so much control over uh, how the book was going to look and uh, the production. And um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. That's yeah, it was a true collaboration. That's the way. Ongoing conversation. So a couple of folks have asked about the Her the Keith Herring Foundation. Did you work with them at all on this? Did they know about it? Were they involved? What what was that? Is there any connection? This is actually an um we didn't work with the foundation on this book. Um so that's why in the book you won't see reproduced um photographs and images. Uh so no, we went and, um, and did it without including actual artworks, which is an interesting challenge for Josh, actually. Yeah, I think in the, in the beginning, um, <clears throat> it seemed almost impossible to do this biography without actually showing his work. But uh, the more we talked about it, the more it made sense to, um, uh, you know, because 
so many people can actually just you know anyone can just look up his work and see what it is uh but it seemed uh, much more interesting to try to describe his environment and also uh, figure out a way to um, describe his work without actually uh, copying it. And I think that was one of my first, or my main uh, concerns about taking on this project is I just didn't want to do like a, uh, like a, you know, not great copy of this famous artist. Um, that was like the last thing I wanted to do. So, so it was sort of perfect that uh, we had to work around this. That's so great. So um, it's, it's almost 10 after seven, but we've still got 150 people here with us. So why don't I ask you two more questions? How does that feel? Great. Okay, great. Um, the first question is about, um, from David in Seattle, Washington. How did you deal with the more difficult parts of Herring's work and life, AIDS, eroticism, et cetera, in a book for children. What, what, was, that, what was that line like for you? For me, it was really important um, to be brave and candid. Um, it was um, one of my sort of central intentions was not to shy away from really telling the story of Keith's life. And the one thing I want to say to David in Seattle is that there's this incredible article, it's an interview actually on the cover of Rolling Stone in August 1990, um, or sorry, August 1989. And um, in it, Keith expresses his concern about young people growing up in the middle of the AIDS crisis without gay role models and how his real concern about the fact that there weren't enough gay role models um, in the public eye and that he said there must be more openness now. There must be um, greater candor and just greater openness. And so to make a book about him 20 years later, it felt imperative to listen to that and to make a book that was um, aligned with those expressed wishes, I'll say. But it wasn't, wasn't easy. I mean, it was tricky to figure out how, what, what line to walk. And, I, and I, this is something I really credit um, our publisher um, and that Claudia was really also shared that, um, not only concern, but determination. To, um, to make a book that felt as brave as it must be in order to be the tribute that we wanted to create to this person that we admire so much. Thank you so much for that. That's really, yeah, that's really great. Um, last question from Mayumi who, oh, I'm sorry, from Mayumi and Leo who is six, who wants to know where did Keith Haring's art ideas come from? Oh, I think uh, he kept a, uh, Keith Aaron kept, kept a sketchbook. Um, and I think that he just made a lot of things all the time. So it was just constantly, you know, pouring out of him, you know. Um, it seemed like he was uh, very much inspired by the people around him, their environments that he lived in. Uh, all the things that he read and watched, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of like from all these different places. Um, I, I, I love that the fact that he, um, he was just always making things all the time. And I think it's just one of those uh, things that if you're making things all the time consistently, then um, uh, it's just, uh, it's perhaps a little bit easier to uh, keep, keep on that track, you know, keep making things. I also would say he got his ideas from, from everywhere, from, from his everyday life, from his fears, his dreams, his concerns, his joys. Um, and one thing we haven't really talked about is Keith's activism, um, that Keith was an artist who responded in his artwork to things he was really concerned about. And um, to he spoke out against nuclear proliferation and he spoke out about literacy and he spoke out about um the drug epidemic and he spoke out about 
um, AIDS and he spoke out about apartheid. And um, so he was, he kind of didn't have any limits. I don't think about what he would respond to. It was anything that inspired him, that scared him, that, you know, uh, that he felt strongly about. Um, and that's kind of amazing, Josh, right? An artist who has that breadth, right? Who's not afraid yeah. to venture into all of that territory. Yeah, it's so free. So and I guess the Radiant Baby is maybe one of his most um, iconic images. Um, and the Barking Dog. And so also, yes. Yes. Yeah, there it is. So he was inspired by children. I mean, childhood and children were also a really really central inspiration, dancing. Thank you, thank you so much. So tell us where we can get your book. Well, um, as you guys all know, we're going through a global pandemic. So um, the, one of the best things you could do would be to order the book from your local independent bookstore. Um, to support your local independent is great. Of course, it's available elsewhere online in the obvious places. Um, and, but I, I think it would be such a great thing to support your, whatever your local independent bookstore is. And then also there's a link, is there not, Ariel? Sorry? Isn't there a link? Um, to the Bureau? Yes. Yeah, let me find it. Yeah. We also have a link to a bookstore that is located in the center on 13th Street, um, the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which is located like 50 steps away from Once Upon a Time, um, one of Keith's great murals. So you could, you could find the link that's, I think, in somewhere here, somewhere in I'm the- I'm gonna put page. it in the chat right now, everybody. Yeah, that would be great, or Local Independent make a day of it go see the mural get the book folks have asked us if they can get signed copies is there is that going to happen maybe in the future yeah i think we're uh working on that currently so maybe uh um, it's, a, it's a pandemic challenge for sure yeah. <laughs> it is it is <laughs> Yeah, at the beginning of this, we thought that maybe it wouldn't really affect us, like, but yeah. I don't, but um, we're, uh, we're, we're figuring that out right now, like with some, uh, some options for that, uh, perhaps uh, in the next month or so. Thank you for asking. Ah, oh, and yeah. perhaps through Enchanted Lion, maybe when Matt gets back from. Yeah, yeah, definitely check, uh, check in with them. I think that would be the first place. Thanks, Aubrey. Hi. <laughs> well, thank you both so, so much for your time and your generosity and your artwork and this wonderful tour and lesson about Keith Haring. Um, I hope we can all take inspiration from the dancing babies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks thank for having so us. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you to everyone who, who uh, attended. Uh, we can't see you, but we um, are super grateful to have you here and to share this project with you guys. So thank you so much. Have a good thank night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. night.